Welcome to this month's Navigating Drought on Your Ranch webinar. Um, just a couple of things before we get started. If you do have questions, please put them in the Q&A box at the bottom so we can keep track of them. Um, sometimes things get lost if we just put them in the chat box. And so we'll make sure that those get addressed as we go along. Thank you to everyone that has submitted questions um, when they registered. We use those to direct our conversation, so we really appreciate your input. And we'll start out by introducing ourselves. I'm Miranda Meehan. I'm the Livestock Environmental Stewardship Specialist and the Extension Disaster Education Coordinator. And I'm here in, at the Carrington Research Extension Center with Carl Hoppe. Good afternoon. Carl Hoppe. I'm an Extension Livestock Specialist here at the Carrington Research Extension Center. And we have other participants too. Would they like to introduce themselves? Adnan Haki is a North Dakota State Climatologist and Professor of Climatological Practices at NDSU. And then Zach? I'm Zach Carlson, a Beef Cattle Specialist here based in Fargo on campus. Jana? Hi, I'm Jana Block. I'm the Extension Livestock Specialist based out of the Hedinger Research Extension Center. Lisa? Hi, I'm Lisa Peterson. I'm the Extension Livestock Specialist at the Central Grasslands Research Extension Center near Streeter. Travis, please. Hello, Travis Hoffman, Extension Sheep Specialist uh, based in Fargo, America. And Kevin Sedovic, please. Are you That's there, Kevin? Good. Yes, you hear me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm Kevin Sedovic. I'm the Extension Rangeland Management Specialist out of NDSU and Fargo and the Central Grasslands Research Extension Center Director located near Street. Next, um, Ron. Ron Haugen, Farm Management Specialist uh, in, at NDSU in, in Fargo. And then wrap up with um, Jerry. Yeah, I'm Jerry Stucker. I'm the Extension Veterinarian at Livestock Stewardship Specialist uh, with office in, at NDSU in Fargo. Well, thanks to all our panelists for joining us today. Um, we're going to get started with a drought outlook and update from Adnan um, to kind of set the scene for what things look like moving forward through this drought. Hi again. Uh, I am going to start my presentation with the uh, non-presenter mode, uh, and I will jump to uh, wherever I need to go to from here quickly. Uh, the first one is the, uh, the drought monitor that was published this morning at 8 a.m. Uh, you're looking at the United States map with the D4 uh, and D3 are having the, the largest extensive coverage uh, on record since 2007, since 2000. And you're looking at the other drought stricken areas in the United States. The map on the right hand side is showing the four week change. And as you see, uh, not much change happened during the past four weeks other than uh, the improvement of the drought conditions uh, parallel with the amount of precipitation the areas are getting. For example, Southwest and Northwestern portions of the state having uh, the greater than six inch of rain uh, eliminate uh, the one category improvement in that in those area, except for a small portion of a darker green color indicating two category improvement. So uh, if you are looking for the entire PowerPoint presentation. It is going to be available at NDSU Drought. Uh, the, the correct address would be uh, egg.ndsu.edu forward slash drought. And now you're looking at the uh, North Dakota. You're focusing in there. And 18% of the state is experiencing D4 or exceptional drought. Exceptional drought is introduced in North Dakota three times. This year, 2017 and 2006 to show you how rare that uh, intensity is. D3 drought is covering at least 63% of the uh, North Dakota and still is the largest coverage on record since 2000. And as a result, 100% uh, of the, uh, the state is experiencing some kind of drought and the people or the population in drought area is 672,000 plus. Um, some of the reason that led us to uh, forming that kind of drought monitor map is the 30-day uh, precipitation on the left-hand side, the actual amount. You'll see a big bullseye between the uh, Burke and the Divide County amount is 6.48. And uh, if you compare it with the normal, these are the percent of normal, 200% is indicating twice as much precipitation falling in the area. 
and, and you're looking at some of the other bullseye of a, a heavy precipitation falling uh, denoted by the green and the blue colors. Next slide is gonna take me into the uh, longer period, 60 days on the left-hand side, 90 day on the right-hand side percent of precipitation. And again, uh, most of that precipitation that come during the last 30 day period is going to impact a much longer period of drought. And again, blue colors are indicating above normal as the red colors are indicating below normal precipitation. And even when we look at the six month, this is the six month period uh, percent of precipitation. And, and again, during that past 30 day periods of precipitation is contaminating the data uh, back to six month period. Um, we talked about that before. And so I am gonna go directly into drought severity and coverage index. That is a one composite index that shows you the coverage as well as severity in one number. And 375 is the current number. That is one point improvement uh, compared to the previous normal. And, and the previous highest numbers are 295, that was in 2017, and 329, uh, that was uh, in 2006. And all the uh, three incidences, North Dakota ended up uh, D4 or exceptional drought. And when I calculate the area underneath the curve, it gives me an accumulated impact of the drought starting in 2020 in North Dakota. And the number is, uh, that is a 50, 58 consecutive week accumulation. And compared to the other drought years, and we surpassed 2017, 2018 drought already. So uh, some of the other droughts that mega drought years that left uh, to be comparable with the 2004, 2005, uh, and, and this is, uh, this is a, a longevity, uh, the part of the, uh, the equation, but not the intensity. We have never been that intense before since 2000. So if I wanted to compare uh, a kind of economical impact of this current drought, we said we just surpassed 2017 drought that cost North Dakota between one to $2 billion. And this is for since 2007, I had questions before, how would you compare to current drought with the, uh, the previous drought uh, going all the way back to 1900. And here's a nine month SPI or the standardized precipitation index that allows me to go a hundred years on, on the record. And the current number is uh, negative 2.64. Uh, negative numbers are indicating drought and positive numbers are indicating wet periods. So that would be compatible with the 1979, 1980 drought and the SPI number was negative 2.72. Uh, so we are not quite there yet. And the next one is going to be comparable to 1977-1988. And the uh, SPI number is 2.77. And another number that is going to be 1935-1936. And that number is 2.95. And you got to keep in mind this 1930s drought was uh, uninterruptedly uh, extended. And we are only looking at this nine month period. And that was 2.77. Um, this would be a great way to look at the current drought if the drought lasted only nine months. However, we've been in drought for a longer period. Looking at the uh, 12 months SBI, uh, we are not as, as bad during this time of period, some of the other numbers. And next question would be, is this going to be another mega drought? Are we getting into a mega drought? So. Uh, here where we are when we look at the 24 month SPIs, uh, just a little sliver. And it is a good process for us to determine uh, the separating of the wet periods with the dry periods. It looks like, and here the, um, the wet period that we started in, in early 19, 1990, 1993 actually, it just ended several years ago. And the question would become, are we getting into a dry period? And the, the answer is yes, we are. But are we getting into a mega drought period is, is really unknown uh, just because of that little sliver just we just started. And uh, what stands out is the 1980s drought, 1950s drought, and 1930s drought stands out the big one in this, uh, in this scale. Coming to a soil moisture ranking percentile for this drought is the surface uh, soil moisture to four inches and brown and the red colors are indicating much drier than normal conditions. And only near normal conditions are 
the portion that received a significant precipitation. If you look at on the right-hand side, it is a soil moisture to three feet. Uh, red and brown, darker colored browns are indicating much, much drier than normal soil moisture conditions. Uh, I am going to skip this one for the interest of the time and this one too. Um, and you are going to be reading a whole bunch of client, uh, the county impact, drought impacts. Then you look at the uh, actual power presentation uh, in the, the website. Uh, I wanted to talk about the forecast on the left-hand side. It is the seven-day quantitative precipitation index. Um, two days ago, when we looked at this, it was pretty much uh, dry. But now, uh, looking from here into the next seven-day period into July 1st, uh, you will see some pockets of blue colors indicating uh, a precipitation on the order of 0 0.75 to 1 inches. But the rest of the other uh, location and state is indicating there is going to be some precipitation precipitation events. On the right hand side, it is the, the next seven day period that's going to take me into July 1st. Average temperature departure from normal. Uh, some of these numbers be, are ranging from uh, four to eight, meaning that the eight degree Fahrenheit above normal on average daily into July 1st. Looking further into the future, this is gonna take me into July 1st through July 14th, the second week. Uh, precipitation on the left-hand side is indicating below normal uh, precipitation expected. On the right-hand side, it is showing significantly warmer than normal conditions can be expected during the second week. Looking at the week three and four, or is this way? Uh, precipitation is still below normal as the temperatures are still above normal. Uh, this is updated on July 17, the forecast for July. Uh, forecast for July is indicating, especially Western portions of the state where the drought is most stricken, uh, is has in having a greater chance of getting below normal precipitation. And temperature wise, it is the, the pattern. It is uh, the warmer or much warmer than normal conditions are expected. Looking further into the three months, uh, outlook July through September. Uh, equal chance of having above, below, or near normal precipitation. Uh, so as, as you're looking further into the future, our skill level falls down. Therefore, you are going to see a whole bunch of areas in the white indicating no skill in the forecast. Temperature-wise, um, the, the model is more skillful to tell us uh, above normal temperatures or warmer than normal temperatures can be expected. And now this time, I am showing you a little further into the future September through November, that is going to take us into the end of growing season. Um, warmer than normal conditions, again, uh, this, this might be a bad news when you have coupled with the drier than normal conditions, especially on the southwestern portion of the state, as the remaining of the state is in um, equal chance of heaven above, below, or near conditions. That's all I have. Miranda? Thank you, Adnan. Um, I wish you had better news for us, but thank you for joining us and sharing. Yeah, uh, really appreciate that type of insight. Uh, Miranda, uh, extension agents have screened over 500 livestock watering samples this year. What are they documenting in the screenings that they're completing? They're kind of, those screenings are really all over the place, um, but we have documented several um, potentially toxic waters with high elevated levels of total dissolved solids and, and our sulfates. And sulfates tend to rate as of now tends to be a more sensitive measure we've been seeing when we've mm. been doing those screenings. And then, um, yeah, and right now they're starting to see, the other thing is um, with the above average temperatures and water being a little lower, increases the risk for cyanobacteria blooms. And we're, we're starting mm. to see those reports. Um, there's been a handful of reports of of cyanobacteria blooms across the state in the past week. Um, so as we move into the 4th of July, which, which is when we traditionally see those blooms, I expect that we're gonna see more of those reports. So what does your producers do if they have bad reports? Well, I think first thing is if you're concerned um, and is contact your ex local extension agent, they can come out and help you with that screening. And depending what that screening results are, they can help you collect a sample and get that submitted to the lab and interpret that, mm -hmm. that sample um, and, we'll, and, and working with your local veterinarian as well, not just um, with your extension agent as in a partnership there to make those decisions. 
Good. Jerry, we like to include somebody else here. Jerry uh, Stucka, um, what producers uh, with water quality concerns, what should they be looking for for herd health? And what type of steps should they look to to keep their herds healthy? Yeah, you mean beyond water quality, Carl, I'm assuming. So, oh, I'm really referring to water quality issues. Okay, well, well, um, Miranda touched on some of those already. And, you know, the total, total is all solids, which just means essentially the water's gotten awfully salty. A lot of particulate matter in there. And, and, and most of the time it doesn't cause trouble. The cattle don't like it. They'll drink it, but they'll get diarrhea from it. The first thing you see, but she mentioned sulfates as well. And sulfates is a whole nother story because sulfates combined with hydrogen to produce hydrogen sulfide gas, which is very toxic to cells, particularly cells of the brain. And, and we get a condition that we call polio. Uh, there's actually two kinds of polio, but, but when we're dealing with sulfates, it's usually due to a hydrogen sulfate, um, hydrogen sulfide gas. And cattle will exhibit signs that there's something going on in their brain. They might fall over, they might go into convulsions. Uh, they'll just act like something's not quite right upstairs. And I mean, if you see things like that, there's a whole list of things you need to think about. But if you're dealing with water that that's not of the greatest quality and you've already tested for total dissolved solids and sulfates, you really need to get them out of there and find a different water source or fence the that stock pond off or in some ways provide a different water source because you're gonna have trouble. So those would be the two big ones. And then of course she mentioned already the cyanobacteria thing. Um, so I guess the other thing too is when water gets, the calves probably start suffering first really because sometimes the calves won't go into the deep water drink, they'll just drink along the edges. So not only do you have, tend to have higher algae blooms along the edges, but you, it's just dirtier along the edges as well. So, you know, that water, whole water quality thing and the health of livestock, it, it's, it's of paramount importance, especially during this year and this time with the temperatures being what they are. So is one of our solutions to move cattle away from uh, that water source, even if it means moving them out of that pasture? Well, either that or fence it off and, and you got to put tanks out there and start hauling water. And I know what a job that can be. If you have any number of pastures and in, in no, Eastern North Dakota, we tend to have smaller pastures and many of them. So now you got one person committed almost every day or at least every other day all day long to just water cattle. But if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. And, and I, you know, there's been some, I'll, I'll say this, many ranchers have been proactive on this water thing. And I see many more tanks out there that are supplied by well water, sometimes supplied by uh, rural water. And that's made a huge difference. And for those that were proactive and have those facilities now, you know, then, then water quality isn't an issue. But for many of us still, there are dugouts and water holes and that we depend on, and they're not gonna be very good this year. Miranda, do you have anything to add to Jerry's comments? I think Jerry covered the most of it, but I think just looking forward to past this, how can we build our resilience in, for future droughts so we can get through them and be, be more prepared and you know, working to develop additional water sources. Um, obviously the media is excluding animals and looking at different op water options and hauling water if necessary. Ron, uh, is there any type of assistance programs that could be available for water quality issues for producers? Uh, indirectly, uh, there's not really programs just for quality of, of the water, but it, it, if your quality is bad, there is assistance for getting water to livestock. And there's a, 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 about three programs that I wanted to touch on here. Um, it's hard to keep all the acronyms straight with FSA, but one of them is called ECP, Emergency Conservation Program. And um, that's where there's emergency funds to help rehabilitate uh, uh, land and, 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 and uh, conservation structures damaged by natural disasters, kind of a, kind of a catch-all. It's a cost share program. The other one is called ELAP, E-L-A-P, stands for Emergency Assistance for Livestock, Bees, and Fish. Um, and that's for if there's livestock that are diseased or there's adverse weather that are affecting them. 
And this does include um, some funds for water transportation for hauling water. Uh, the loss must be uh, in the physical county, uh, physically in the county where it occurs. You need to apply 30 days after the event ends or the deadline, uh, mm -hmm. ultimate deadline is January 30th, 2022. Um, um, and there's also FSA emergency loans that have kicked in now. They're 2.875%. So if a producers need to, to drill wells, uh, run lines, um, there is some emergency funds. Contact your uh, local farm, farm service agency for any of those programs for all the details. There's also a program uh, run by the state. I thought it was actually run through the North Dakota Department of Ag, but I called there this morning and it's actually run by the State Water Commission. And um, they have funding uh, on hand for new wells, for tapping into rural water, for piping, for pasture, uh, tapping pastures uh, into water systems. Um, uh, you, you must, of course, be approved that you are a livestock producer and 50% of your income is from the farm. Uh, but that does not include any money for hauling water, just for wells and such. So those are the programs that are that are are are, are that are um, used for for uh, helping water the live the water the livestock. In, so indirectly, if you have bad water and you want to get good water there, something you should check into. Thank you. Well, we spent a lot of time talking about water. I'd like to move to another area that's talk about forage production. Miranda, in the past, you've stated that the window for forage production is closing. Can you explain this and discuss the current state of forage production across the state? Yeah, so in North Dakota, 80 to 90% of our forages are cool seasons. And mm -hmm. the with those growth curves for those grasses, they, their peak growth occurs with, from rains in conjunction with rains that occur from April um, through the end of June. And we're, July is, 1 is quickly approaching us. And so by the time we hit July 1, the majority of our forage in the state has been produced. Um, and that's actually, we already know in terms of hay production um, that those grasses have gone to seed. Once the grass goes to seed and is out of the vegetative state, there's little potential for additional growth. Um, and from the reports that we're hearing um, from farmers and ranchers across the state that are in the process of hanging now, there's a lot of reports of 25% of normal. Um, and those are in the areas that aren't as, as hard hit. Um, when we get into that D4 area, um, we're looking at no, no hay for a lot, of, a lot of producers in that area. So some really significant impacts to hay production um, on the native forage, those grasses are just starting to get to that reproductive stage or native cool seasons. So they're still growing. Um, if you are able to get out there and start grazing before they headed out, we might be able to capture some and make, take advantage of some rains that do occur in July and get some regrowth. So that is a positive um, that if you're out there grazing and can keep those grasses in a vegetative state. But we're still looking at um, in D4 areas, 25 to 30% of normal and then the rest of the state around 50 to 60% of normal. So significant reductions in forage production um, and looking at Adnan's outlook, our potential for regrowth might be limited as well. Well, with that in mind, if we're gonna have long-term stability of our grasses and maintain production in the future, what's, what do we do? We what's... know, yeah, we know things are gonna get hit a little heavy. Um, we really wanna be careful about allowing recovery time on those, those, those pastures that have, do get a little extra pressure. Um, hopefully you can have a system in place where we, we aren't stressing out all our pastures. Um, our grasses are very resilient in North Dakota. They're used to these, they're adapted to these type of disturbances. And so they will recover. Um, but we want to, we know this, I mean, we've seen from Adnan's data, this drought started last fall and a lot of pastures got hit hard last fall. So I'm trying not to hit those same pastures again and giving them a little extra time to recover and then making sure that you're not overgrazing those same pastures two years back to back because we're gonna see if the increase, redu reduced production after this drought is um, long-term impact. So reduced production after the drought's over, increases in bare ground and you're gonna start to see undesirable plants move in as well. So really just trying to not overgraze repeatedly, um, mo monitoring that utilization the best you can um, 
and trying to get creative when you take advantage of some other forage sources. So kind of on that lines, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Zach and see if he has anything to fill in in terms of, you know, given that where we're at with our current state of forage, what should we be expecting in terms of forage quality? And if we do get some timely summer rains, how is that gonna impact our forage quality? Yeah, so as you stated, um, obviously uh, forage yield is uh, something we can visually see and know that we're having reductions there. In terms of uh, what drought can do for forage quality and what we're experiencing right now, we should consider what the natural seasonal decline is in forages. We know, uh, as you highlighted, that with a predominantly cool season, we're moving away from that vegetative state. We're getting more mature plants, so we're going to see protein and energy values decline in these forages throughout July and into August. <clears throat> so with that in mind, though, uh, and having drought situation, uh, we can actually see forage quality isn't altered as much uh, and nearly to the extent as what forage production is. So quality should be relatively similar to uh, a normal year. Uh, it's possible even to have elevated levels, but I would expect uh, forage quality to be similar to a normal year. But uh, as we move into July here, we know those, those protein values are going to decline in those forages. And uh, I guess we can kind of hope for a little bit of, of summer rain uh, here as some has been giving us some relief. And as you highlighted that giving us that potential chance for regrowth. And uh, of course, at that point, having some vegetative uh, material for, the, for those animals to work on. And uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So when we see that green up, we tend to see that little boost in, in quality for sure. And um, we, when, one of the strategies, obviously, when we're working with reduced forage is, is decreasing that stocking rate somehow. Um, and one way producers can reduce forage demand is early weaning. Um, just how much forage can this, that strategy save? Yeah, there's some good research out there that indicates uh, about a 300 pound calf is consuming around five pounds of forage dry matter on a daily basis. And so if, if we talk about moving our cow herd from a lactation standpoint to a dry cow herd uh, through early weaning, uh, we can expect there to be an equivalent of about three to five pounds of, of decrease in forage intake on a dry matter basis for those cows. So uh, if we kind of put those together, then that's, we're looking at somewhere between eight to 10 pounds on a dry matter basis of forage uh, per uh, pair per day. So really what that means though, is essentially uh, through early weaning, we can be looking at uh, possibly reducing our uh, grazing pressure by about a third. Uh, um, so uh, it's really can be uh, a great way to relieve some of that pressure when we talk about longevity of these pastures uh, can really give us an opportunity here, especially as some of us are moving into breeding, uh, if, if we have to try to maintain condition on those cows as well. Thanks, Zach. Um, Jerry, to follow up with that, if, if we're concerned, if someone's considering early weaning, um, when is the op optimal time? I mean, how can we reduce the stress of the calf and keep them healthy during this? So what's interesting about early weaning is that sometimes we think it's going to be a, a disaster taking those calves off the cows and from that milk diet than they are, that they're used to and putting them on a different diet. And in truth, what it seems like based on observations is that early weaning actually works pretty well. The, the key is, is to how to do it. And, and if, if you have one that already had some creep feed out for calves and they've gotten used to it, that's that's a really good start where you can actually just move the creek feeder right into the pen and the calves continue to eat on something that they've been used to. What's going to make it a little bit harder for this this year though is <clears throat> as I introduce them to a forage diet beyond the grass they've been eating, uh, where does that come from, right? I mean our hay crops have, uh, they're almost non-existent at this point and so th that's going to be the challenge. Uh, 
I don't know. I don't necessarily think you want to keep them on creep feed forever. They tend to get a little bit uh, fleshy from just creep feed itself. You need something in there that fills that rumen up and and uh, and put, get, puts them on a good start to, to gaining, you know, respectable amount of pounds each and every day. Health wise, though, as I kind of said earlier, health wise, weaning those calves and a part part of it's because passive immunity that they picked up through the colostrum is still with them. And it seems like uh, when you wean calves at that age, health it, health is a pretty good, um, they don't seem to have a great deal of health problem. And, that, and that, that's really related to respiratory disease. We can get into other issues with health besides just respiratory disease. I mean, we can run into pink eye outbreaks. You can run into foot rot outbreaks, not necessarily just to, associated with weaning, but even on pasture as well. But but having the facilities, making sure they're designed properly, making sure they're they're designed so that they keep in small calves, which is always a challenge, making sure that the bunks are suitable so calves can eat out of them without escaping. Um, it, it takes some uh, it takes some creativity to wean really young small calves, but it sure sure can be done and just to feed off of what Zach was talking. And Jan and I have been have talked about this before that the nutrient requirements for the cows decreases by quite a bit. And uh, of course, now you're putting on a calf on a, on a plane of nutrition that should result in good things. So um, yeah, I, and, and I, I suspect that this summer we're gonna see a fair number of calves weaned early. It doesn't mean necessarily early weaning, but they're gonna wean them earlier than we normally would have in the past. Switching gears from our shortage in forage and pasture and kind of focusing a little bit more on the hay and what we've been hearing um, concerns about getting that first cutting alfalfa and uh, there's research out that that, sh that shows hay and alfalfa that's less than 10 inches can have negative impacts to the health of that stand. And so we know grazing can be a good option to utilize this alfalfa and keep it in a vegetative state. So we have that potential for a second cutting because once they flower out, obviously we're we, we're losing that um, once they go to seed. Jana, what precautions should we take in if, so we can safely graze alfalfa? Yeah, so I've talked to a couple producers around the state and also some extension agents where this is being done. Um, obviously it's one way to kind of salvage a little bit of value. If you can't get a hay crop, at least maybe you could get some livestock out there grazing. Um, most of the time, we're not too concerned about health risks as far as bloat um, until we get into that 30 to 50% of alfalfa in the pasture. Um, many times our, our pastures with alfalfa are grass dominated and, and it shouldn't be too much of a concern. But if you do have a high percentage of alfalfa, that's where the risk obviously is gonna increase. Um, so, you know, I'm sure we're past the point of the bud stage. That's what we usually recommend that that where people kind of wait to get to that bud stage, um, your forage quality is gonna be good and the risk of bloat isn't quite as high. Usually it's higher earlier in the growing season um, as that plant starts to mature and put out buds and then flowers, that risk is going to decrease a little bit. Um, I'm sure most of the alfalfa across the state is, is already in flower, flowering mode. So um, that risk will, will be decreased already. Um, but it is still something to, to be aware of that you can have issues. So just some of our standard management recommendations when we talk about alfalfa, um, don't turn them out hungry, make sure they've got a good full feed um, of some dry hay or they've been grazing, you know, another pasture where, they, where they're not hungry. Um, don't turn out when it's raining or when there's a heavy dew that can increase the risk. Um, and then a lot of people will use the, the bloat blocks or paloxylene blocks. Um, the thing with those is you need to have them out a couple days before um, the animals are going to graze the alfalfa and then you need to have them out the entire time that they are grazing because once you remove that block, there's no protection. So that is a potential strategy, but just be aware of that. Um, another kind of nutritional tool is ionophore that can be provided through a commercial supplement or mineral that can also help with digestive issues like bloat. Um, so that's another potential tool. And then I would say just 
monitor and continue to watch those animals and make sure you're not having issues. Thank you, Jana. Um, Ron, you know, we've been talking a lot about forage production shortages. What assistance available to producers that are short on forage? Well, there's a couple pro, uh, programs, CRP and LFP. And also, as I mentioned previously, uh, there is emergency loans available, FSA loans, if, if producers are so inclined to have to borrow money to pay for, for forage uh, as well. Uh, first of all, CRP, uh, there is emergency gra grazing that's, that's happening right now that's immediately ongoing. You can, you can go and apply and, and, and graze livestock right away. Um, and any county in the state that's, that's eligible for LFP, which I'll get to in a bit, um, are eligible. There's only two county, there's three counties in the state that are not eligible, Richland, Ransom, and Sargent. Um, and uh, so every other county, uh, the, the CRP is open for the emergency grazing. Um, it, you can only do, well, you need to submit an, app, an application, 50%, uh, you can only graze up to 50% carrying capacity, not for more than 90 days. Uh, emergency haying will, will come into effect, but not until August 1st. Um, bales need to remove, be removed by September 15th, and there is no reduction on the CRP payment. As far as the LFP program, some of you are probably familiar with that. Uh, we do have a map on our uh, drought page. Um, as I mentioned, there's three county, There's only three counties that, that, that do, are not eligible for LFP. Um, the payments are based on the drought monitor. Uh, there's a formula uh, uh, based on the number of head and the number of acres. And then, then there's a formula that's basically 60, 60 percent of the lesser of the, the number of the head or the cattle or the number of head or the acres based on the formula. And we do have a calculator online uh, uh, on our on a farm management website. And I believe it's a link on the drought page uh, that will producers can enter in their information and come up with an estimate. But contact your FSA office for either of those two programs. That's great. Miranda, there's been a lot of producers that are thinking about planting annual forages, mostly because their field crop has already been so short and they're thinking maybe we get some rain later on. Can they plant something? Uh, what's your thoughts there? Is there an opportunity for this? Yes, there is. There is an, there's still this opportunity to get an annual forage established if we have adequate moisture. Um, we're, since we're moving forward in the growing season, depending on how we, what we wanna do with that forage depends on what we would dictate what we wanna plant. So if we're looking at haying, um, we really best options are gonna be your millets or a, or a sorghum or a sedan grass. Um, we can do a sorghum sedan as well, but that has a higher nitrate with risk than mm. your millets or your sedan grass. Um, so that's something to be aware of. And during drought, we know that that nitrate risk is gonna, is going to increase. Um, and I know Jana will talk about that more. Um, the other thing though, is if you're grazing, we still would, I still recommend doing some type of mix, some that has cool season, warm season, and some brassicas in it. Um, mm. Just being careful on a selection of those species again. But when we have a mix, it reduces the risk associated with planting that, that cover crop. Um, something is likely gonna take if we have moisture available. Um, and as, but as we move through the growing season, that's kind of where we're at. And then if we do get fall moisture, there is that opportunity to put in a winter cereal as well. So looking at our triticale, our annual rye um, are good options. And I know Kevin, if he's on, if Kevin, you might have more to add. I know you're, you've done a lot more of this research than me. Yeah, I appreciate the, the question there. And it's a great question. And I think you're right in that there is still time to plan any kind of emergency annual forage. And, and I, I agree with you on the cover crop mixes to for grazing purposes. And, and, the, and the winter cereals are gonna be looked at more this year than we've seen in the past. Um, we'll get that opportunity to plant something in August and September, whether you're looking at a winter rye or winter treated kale, um, even a winter wheat in terms of those varieties are, are great options for forage that will fit you for next spring at least. Cause I think most people are gonna run out of feed uh, they're going to purchase feed and then they're going to need something for next year as well. And it's a great opportunity to look at these winter cereals that can be seen this fall. And I think, you know, it's, it's important that you, we, we talk about it being dry, but you can't grow an annual forage if you don't plant it. And so even 
at the research station. We're putting in some millet uh, this week and next week, and we are going to put a full season cover crop in. Um, just trying to keep the cost down as best we can, but knowing that if we do get some moisture, at least we can have something to either put up in a bale or graze it later this summer. Kevin, I've had some people ask about planting hay, bit, well, uh, a, a, a forage barley instead of millet. What's your thoughts on that at this time of the year? Yeah, I mean, th that's a great question, Carl. And I think your risk in terms of, of success will be going down on these cool season crops. If I was going to pick any of this, the, the, the cool season cereals, I would do a forage barley over a forage oat or a tritted kale. It tends to do a little better in terms of, of the droughty conditions. Um, but in terms of a hay crop, your lowest risk will be your foxtail millets since they are the best scavengers. They also take the least amount of water. And so I would, I would, unless that was your last option, I would not be doing any cool seasons right now, unless I want to graze it. And then I put that cool season in a mix with a brassica in a warm season. Sure. Thank you. Jana, much of the spring wheat across the state's in pretty poor condition due to the drought and producers are considering harvesting and forage if it's more than three inches tall. Uh, <laughs> what, what steps should be taken uh, to utilize it as a forage? In other words, should we do nitrate analysis, forage testing? What should we be looking at? Yep. So just like with every other drought that we've been through, I'm sure we're going to start getting a barrage of questions about how to utilize all these failed crops as forage. Um, so first of all, you definitely want to check with your insurance people and make sure, you know, if you're looking at an alternative use, that's an important first step. Um, with, with most of these crops, there can be a variety of nutritional concerns. Um, you know, like canola is one that gets widely grazed um, during drought years, and canola can kill livestock multiple ways. We can have polio issues because it has high sulfur content. Um, we can have bloat because it's extremely high in energy. And we can also have high nitrate. So there's lots of stuff to test and, and check out ahead of time. Um, being proactive and knowing what you've got is definitely important. Um, with many of our, our cereal grains, those are all potential nitrate accumulators. Most of the county offices across the state have a nitrate quick test that can be used out in the field. So if you uh, can sweet talk your extension agent into coming out and taking your sample for you, that's an option or um, producers can take the sample themselves. You would just basically kind of walk um, some transects in like a W or M shape across your field, um, get at least 20 stems, get them close to the ground, take it into your extension agent. And they can tell you with that quick test whether nitrate is present or not. Um, if it is, and you're looking at a grazing situation, um, you might wanna wait a couple days and then retest. So that test can be done again, um, or you can, take a few more days and send that sample off to a lab so you know exactly what you're dealing with. Um, the challenge with a grazing situation versus harvested forage is that we don't know exactly what the livestock are going to consume. We don't know where they're going to consume and there are hot spots out in a lot of fields um, where the concentrations might be higher. So producers should think about um, maybe providing some additional forage that's that has no nitrates in it. So some grass hay, um, also providing some type of energy supplement can help with that conversion process and make sure that the nitrate is getting converted to amino acids and protein in the rumen. Um, it's just when that nitrate piles up and the bacteria get behind that we have a, a problem. So energy supplement can help with that. It's not going to prevent all your issues. So it's, it's definitely best if we have that opportunity to get the sample sent off to the lab so we know you know, on a quantitative basis, exactly how much we're dealing with. But again, the grazing situation is the most challenging. Um, if they have already baled crops, um, I would definitely just go towards getting a hay probe and getting core samples of those bales. The quick test isn't going to be the best route for that, but um, getting 10% of your bales sampled or a minimum of 20 core samples should give you a good representative sample. Zach, I know uh, Jana covered some of this, but what other steps can producers take to reduce the risk of nitrate poisoning when feeding drought stress crops? Or I can even ask, what about grazing? it? Yeah, so the goal in all of this is to know what you have by testing, through testing, 
and then slow the intake of those high nitrate feeds. So if it's forages and you're grazing, lighten the stocking rate, uh, maybe go to uh, half of what you would normally allocate for AUMs. And as well as start, uh, if you do have a map of your fields, because you've tested them now, have, start in those lower uh, nitrate fields. Uh, like Janet alluded to, you, you may have some of those hot spots, so proper sampling and moving across that field to try to cover as much randomness as you can is important for those, that nitrate quick test. But uh, starting with your lowest fields and working uh, towards those higher fields can helps those cattle adapt because you really want those microbes to adapt to that higher nitrate. So start with your low. And that applies really into feeding situations as well. If, if you've tested your feeds and you know what your forages are providing, grinding is your best bet. If that's not an option and you can't grind your higher nitrate forages with your low nitrate forages and do a blend, then at that point, what you would want to do, just as Jana alluded to, is fill them up on those low nitrate forages first uh, before offering uh, a higher nitrate forage. And so, but but keeping in mind doing an appropriate blend and, and moderating how much you're actually allocating that high nitrate. So always be on the safe side and providing more of that forage that's safe and that safe level of nitrate than in the higher portions, but it, it, you can blend those and, and utilize that way. Um, and yeah, uh, in siling might be another option, uh, possibly, uh, depending on what your moisture status is currently. If you're still operating at 70, maybe even 60% moisture, uh, you could still uh, entertain the idea of in siling those mm -hmm. Um, small grains. Um, and that is a great way to reduce nitrates. You can actually reduce your concentration uh, to in uh, by about half, maybe even. So it's a, it's a great way if you can um, uh, utilize that. I would also, with... can I jump in here, Carl? Um, don't assume that your ensiling has taken all the nitrates out and you're at safe level, because if you are extremely high and you take them down to half, you can still be toxic. So still please test. <laughs> that is a good point, Jana. Thank you. I have to follow up with a question with Jana. I mean, with uh, Miranda here asking about grazing high nitrate crops. Are nitrates located in certain parts of the plant that could be higher toxicity than lower? Yeah. Can we graze the tops? Yeah, or so that's part of the stocking rate um, that Zach alluded to is it, it, nitrates tend to be lower in the plant. And actually, because of how plants uptake nitrates, they actually might be in the lower parts of the field where we actually have some moisture that has allowed that plant to utilize the nitrate in, in the soil surrounding it. Mm. Um, so it's, though they're drought stress, the, the moisture availability might actually increase nitrate levels in those plants. So that's another thing to be aware of. But okay. that's why we recommend um, lighter stocking rate so that we're not grazing those plants as low and we're reducing that potential health risk. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. So speaking of random forages that will <laughs> probably be getting put up, well, we've been getting some inquiries on harvesting cattails. Um, and are they worth harvesting and how can they be utilized? Carl, do you have any insights on this? Sure. My first comment is usually uh, make sure you don't get your tractor stuck when you're out harvesting the cattail. Some sloughs might be deceiving. While they appear to be dry, they might have some moisture in them, even in a drought situation like we are. On the other hand, cattails are usually of poor quality and a lot of lignin involved in them. Uh, although a short cattail can be very palatable and actually have some nutrients to it. Ultimately, it comes down to when you're in a drought situation, if you're looking for feed, by all means, please put up the cattails. It'll be something we can feed to the cows and at least blend with other feeds. Perhaps it's the high nitrate feeds that you have as you put up someplace else. At least there's some forage there that you can, can do it with. Uh, cattails will make great bedding if you need to bed. So that might free up some other feed sources to do it. Um, Cattails uh, should probably be tub ground if you're going to be feeding them, otherwise cattle will sort and move them around. Old cattails are pretty woody. These young lush plants are pretty wet. They're kind of waxy. They might take a long time to dry. It all depends upon what your cattail slough is like. Now, there's another direction here a guy can go. If you do put up the cattails, uh, maybe it's old growth and it's been there for a long time and you can get a lot of poor quality forage in. 
if you got enough moisture, you could actually add cover them and, and use ammonium, uh, anhydrous ammonia, not ammonium, but anhydrous ammonia to try to break down the lignin bonds and make a better quality feed. But that requires some moisture. If you don't have moisture, you can look at alternatives like calcium oxide, hydroxide, and add that into it. It's a fairly caustic reaction, but it'll increase the feed value of the feeds. Some of that work was done down in Nebraska a few years ago when we had droughts. Maybe Zach is familiar with some of that and could talk a little bit more. But those are options. They have a cost. But ultimately, cattails um, normally would say, don't bother. But this year, if you can get in there and put them up, by all means, please do. We can make use out of it. If all things fail, be sure to go ahead and, and feed test it to know what we actually have. But there's options. Yeah, I think take advantage of all the options available this year, for sure. Um, so following up, as many producers are starting to hay, we know production is going to be significantly less than normal. We've already discussed that. Um, so the drought though is expanding as well. Um, I'm sure a lot of people know that it's expanding to the east of us. So almost all of Minnesota is, exp is experiencing some level of drought now as well as Iowa, um, a lot of Wisconsin. Um, so currently 65% of our hay within the acres in the US are in, in an area of drought. Um, so that's sure. really gonna reduce our ability to source hay and, find a, and finding other feeds with how widespread this drought is. Um, what other options are available to producers? Well, remember, we, we tend to think cattle need hay, but they can get by with a lot of other feeds too. And one of the first feeds I think of our co-products that are produced through our milling plants, whether it be an ethanol plant or a flour milling plant or a soy crush, there's a fi high fiber feeds that can be utilized in those, uh, in our cattle rations. They're usually high in protein and high-end digestible fiber. So they're actually a fairly decent source and they're easy to truck. So if you need extra feed, those are one way a person can go. If you're gonna do that, you should be sure to be talking to whoever you're gonna be supplying it from at least three months in advance because everybody's jockeying for position now for feeds and your supply might be, if you wait until the last week, your supply won't be available. You need to really look much more in advance than what we have been training ourselves over the past years. Um, there are other feeds we can put up that we haven't put up yet. And I'm referring to our corn crop that's out there that's in some stages, we'll say struggling to make a crop in other places. Well, I, I don't know. We don't know yet. But keep that in the back of your mind as something that could be ensiled or hayed or grazed the toxicity issues we talked about with nitrates, but that is a feed resource that is still out there growing. Things are green, but there's not much. Okay, there's one more thing we look at as an alternative to, and that's shipping our cattle someplace else to be fed. We can either retain the ownership or sell them. Cows are probably going to go someplace, but um, there are places that have pivots under irrigation and they raise corn, and there's a phenomenal amount of forage produced underneath those pivots, there's dry land corn in Iowa. And I know for us in North Dakota, if we don't, if we have a 200 bushel corn crop, we're thinking we probably had a great production. And in Iowa, some of those places say we just had a failure. So there's a lot of forage there. They don't have fences and they may not have water, but those are two things that can still be overcome. And uh, it, so that's our choice is to ship out of state. If we need to, we might have to go a long ways away. There are places with rain. Yes. <laughs> So following up on that, Lisa, if that's an option that people are looking at pursuing, um, what steps do they need to take if they're moving those animals out of state? Thank you, Miranda. So as we look at maybe moving some animals out of state, um, first of all, we need to think about the regulations of moving livestock back and forth. Uh, so you need to think about um, the brand inspection requirements of animals leaving North Dakota and talk to your local brand inspector or uh, the North Dakota Stockman's Association in North Dakota uh, manages the state brand program. And so they can help you with those regulations. Uh, then you need to look at the animal import requirements and both to the state you're going to and the state uh, and then coming home as well. And so the place to start with um, looking at those requirements is 
your local veterinarian, and then the North Dakota Board of Animal Health or our state veterinarian in the state capitol. They can share those requirements. Now, there's some management things that I would encourage producers to look at as um, they are considering moving their stock particular well even in state but out of state uh, to being for being uh, fed I would make a visit to those operations um, talk to them about how they would manage their livestock um, from personal experience they may not manage livestock the way you do but they still may be managed well and um, those are tough pills sometimes to swallow and Carl's kind of giggling about that um, but that as long as they're well managed and um, you know, things with biosecurity are fine, and they're on a nutritionally balanced diet. Um, I think those are good things. I would always ask for references and then try to find some references that aren't offered. And so maybe that means calling around in the community and see what these people, um, what their reputation is. Are they known to be really good producers or are they known to kind of be maybe not the best in the country? Um, we have two publications at NDSU Extension that might help, especially if your livestock are going to a, a dry lot situation or a feed yard situation. One is the Cattle Producer's Guide to Feedlot Terminology. And um, the other is, and I got to look up the true name, but I think it's like a, a Cattle Producer's or Cow-Calf Producer's Guide uh, to Feeding Cattle. And both of those will help it help a producer in understanding the things like um, yardage, shoot fees, uh, some of those things that come with that. And then finally, before I ever moved cattle or um, even sent them there, I would have a signed contract with what's going to happen. Uh, some of the, the toughest questions I get are from really, really good cattle producers on the owner side and really good cattle feeders on the feeding side that have not had a contract and there's disputes about care, uh, disputes about paying, disputes about all kinds of things. And so I know we all like to operate on a handshake basis, but there's some places that we really need to operate on a contract basis. And this is one of them to protect you and your assets. Lisa, um, a lot of guys are looking at uh, producers are heavily culling their cow herds. Mm -hmm. uh, what tips do you have for culling beyond our standard criteria uh, that you've shared in the past? Is there anything else you'd like to share? Sure. So, you know, I, I think one of the steps of resilience that we see in producers mm -hmm. that are getting through this drought a little easier than some others is that they have kept really pretty good records production wise, the trait wise sure. of cattle that um, are in their that are in their care that they own. And so instead of mass culling all old cows or all young cows or whatever the story may be, they are strate what I like to call strategically culling. And so, you know, they're getting through their list of the old ornery open, bad feet, bad udders and those things. And so once you've gotten through those easy uh, culls, I encourage producers then to start looking at things like uh, production, if they have those records, and um, maybe things such as time of breeding. So for our herds that are, you know, January, February calvers, we probably can tell who is uh, bred right now and who is open right now and save some significant forage. And as we move into what I'd call our later spring calvers, we will have that opportunity as well. So get your date on the preg check calendar for your veterinarian. Um, and, and help save some forage. There's no reason to keep open cattle around, especially in a tough year like this. We do not need to feed them any longer. Um, secondly, you know, I, I think then when we get into these uh, situations where we're gonna have to go even deeper into the herd, um, I would look at moving your um, replacement heifers, your open replacement heifers, so those yearling heifers typically, and see if you can find a dry lot situation for them. Sure. Um, and then I would look probably at trying to maintain our nucleus herd of four to eight year old cows, five to eight, somewhere in there, uh, because those are cows that are in their highest level of production. And that's a really painful thing for me to say because I'm a fan of old cows. We know that it usually takes a cow somewhere six to eight years to pay themselves off. And so every cow that's been in your herd longer than that is making you more money, right? 
but they also take more care. They oftentimes take more feed and some more TLC. And we know that our younger animals certainly need more feed to rebreed uh, as we look at our first calf heifers, for example. And so they might be uh, candidates for going down the road. As I um, have alluded to in the last several weeks, I think before I sold my young stock, I would try to find a market where uh, maybe I could have a contract so I could assure that I'm getting the value back out of them uh, because they are the ones who uh, owe us the most money typically in terms of development and replacement costs. And so, you know, making sure that I can get my money out of them and they're just not being split into a cull cow that's going to go to slaughter and a calf that's going to be early weaned, but actually sold as a pair. Um, and, you know, every operation is different, Carl. Every need is different. Every culling strategy is different. Every production strategy and production goals are different. But as a, I guess, the general basis, that's where I would start. Thank you, Lisa. I certainly understand the issue of the compassion we have on selling that 16-year-old cow that's still raising a calf. Just kind of appreciate and still being around. Jerry, I'd like to ask a question. If I can say one other thing, just a minute here, Carl. If you are having trouble deciding which cows to go in your herd, ask somebody who doesn't have any attachment to the cows in your herd. Um, Ask somebody to come help you make those decisions. Sometimes a second set of eyes is really good. And, and, you know, when I tell people, you know, when you're utter scoring, feet scoring, body condition scoring, all of those things, to always have a second set of eyes. Because when you see your cows every day, you probably don't see their faults, right? And so um, bring in a second set of eyes, whether that's your county extension agent, a veterinarian, even a neighbor. Um, all of those people can really help you out in that predicament and take some stress and pressure off of you. Because I know that I would pick cows differently in our herd than my husband would. Um, and so that's, I, I think that that's a good strategy as well. Sorry, Carl, go ahead. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Dr. Stucka, uh, could you share any producer health concerns that are currently ongoing or that we should be very acutely aware of at this point? Yeah, Carl, maybe just a couple of things. One thing to follow up with Lisa, when you're moving cattle across state lines, she did mention health certificates, and of course, these cattle have to be permanently identified. It's not like you can write a health paper on a group of 100 cows going someplace. They have to be individually animal identified. So sometimes it's a challenge. Sometimes they need to be receive a metal, silver metal tag, or they have a remaining bangs tag, or even electronic ID tag, but they have to be individually identified. Thank you, Dr. Stucka, for adding that in for me. A couple things that come to mind. As we get into this season, fly pressure is going to increase. Um, We're going to have synchronization programs that have already taken place and some yield still to take place. So you've got animal movements from pasture to pasture. You've got sorting going on. You've got separation for a while. And sometimes all of those things can trigger, can actually trigger clinical disease. Um, We tend to see summer pneumonias when we're moving pastures from pasture to pasture. Uh, or when we've got synchronization programs going on where cows and calves are sorted off. And I don't know what it is. You wouldn't think it would be that big of a stress on animals, but it seems to trigger sometimes outbreaks of what we call summer pneumonias, which just simply means that you got calves that are experiencing respiratory disease while they're nursing their mother. It should be the least stressful time in their lives. The other, the other thing that happens at that age of a calf, too, is that passive immunity is declining and they they become more susceptible to some of those organisms. The other thing that that crops up now with hot weather, with flies, is that cattle tend to congregate much more so, whether it's in a a water hole that you actually got water in or whether it's under shade. They're usually fighting flies when they congregate real close together. And so you start seeing some eyes that look a little teary-eyed and all of a sudden you're in the middle of a pink eye outbreak. That can happen as well. Um, When we get cows that are, that are gathering up pretty close together. And when you see that happen, you you have sympathy for them because you know, they're trying to get in the shade and they say, they think they fight flies better when they're all gathered up that way. But if you can apply some fly uh, protection at that time, you'll probably get them to spread out a little bit more and decrease the risk of some of those pathogens that are associated with pink eye 
to be transmitted from animal to animal. If you have cases of pink eye, it's pretty crucial to get out there and, and treat cattle just as soon as you can. And I know that's an issue because out of pasture is not that easy to treat individual animals, especially when facilities may be several miles away. So visit with your veterinarian about an what antibiotic you wanna use and maybe how to accomplish some of those difficult circumstances where treatment is not easy. The same holds true for foot rot, that infectious disease that occurs between the toes, the, the, the toe, the hoof, not the hoof, but the soft tissue above the hoof swells up to a great degree. Those cattle become lame extremely lame, lame almost overnight. And that's a classic case of, of foot rot and they need antibiotic therapy as well. And so visit with your veterinarian about how to accomplish that and what antibiotic to use. Those are the really the three things I think of. And of course, what we oftentimes experience is all of a sudden we found a calf dad or we may all of a sudden find a cow dad. And then, and then that becomes a little bit of a mystery until we start digging. Have your veterinarian involved. If you find a fresh dead, make sure that animal is posted. Always be thinking about things like anthrax, especially with cows. But there are other diseases that can occur during these summer months as well. So please involve your veterinarian to get those taken care of and investigate it just as soon as you can. In this kind of weather, it doesn't take long for a carcass to go bad in a hurry. We're about ready to wrap up for today. So I just want to thank everybody for joining us. Thank our panelists for participating and providing their insights. And please uh, reach out to your local ex extension agent mm -hmm. with any drought-related questions. Um, they'll, if they don't know the answer, they'll get a hold of one of us, and we'll we'll find an answer for you. Um, and I know this is a really stressful time, especially when we're making tough decisions and selling animals that we really don't want to part with, um, but have no choice to. So, you know, be checking in on your neighbors um, and checking mm -hmm. on each other. Um, we have a lot of farm and, and ranch stress resources through NDSU Extension, so check those out if you're not sure how to talk to somebody about that or who to reach out to, um, those resources are available. And join us again um, July 29th for our next Navigating Drought webinar. Hopefully we'll have some better news for you guys then. <laughs> and again, just like to say, be sure to ask your neighbor, how are you doing? And then wait for a response and see how they are doing. Take care. Mm -hmm.